Welcome, everyone, to the Legends of Sport podcast. I'm your host, as always, Andy Bernstein. My guest today is legendary NBA and college coach Paul Westhead. Paul and I go back to his stint as the Lakers head coach in the early 80s. I was still in college and just starting out in the business and got my first taste of NBA basketball with the team he coached to the NBA championship in 1980. Paul recently released his memoirs in a book called Quote, the speed game, my fast times in basketball. This was a thoroughly entertaining book and took me behind the curtain to how Paul's system of fast paced play worked, where it started for him and where it took him. More than a few times, it got Paul fired. <laughs> and he is very open about all of that in his book. I really enjoyed his stories about the Lakers, coaching Hag Gathers, Bo Kimball, and the great LMU team, taking the system to Japan and watching it work there, and winning another professional championship with the WNBA's Phoenix Mercury 27 years after his first title with the Lakers. In fact, Paul is the only coach to win championships in both leagues. Paul is a Shakespearean scholar and teacher, and we have some fun finding parallels between the Bard and basketball, as well as a quote from my main man, Bruce Springsteen, that Paul eloquently relates to coaching and the joy he felt when the speed game worked at its peak. Enjoy this episode with Paul Westhead, and as always, I'll see you guys on the backside. I want to welcome Paul Westhead to the Legends of Sport podcast. So great to see you, man. How are you? I'm fine, Andy. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I uh, I just finished reading your book, and I want to thank Steve Brenner for sending it. And, and I was thoroughly entertained by the book, by the way, because um, I don't know if you remember me like running around. I had the big Jufro in the day, and I was this young fledgling photographer with a mustache and but but I remember that's when I first started was was basically that 79, 80, 80, 80, 81 uh -huh. season. So uh, getting my feet wet back in those days. <laughs> and now you're a Hall of Famer, but uh, OK, that just means I've been around too long, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> so, Paul, I got to tell you that this this two things that convinced me I want to do this interview with you. OK, um, one is anyone that can quote Bruce Springsteen in their own autobiography about sports is OK with me. <laughs> right? All right. The, the second is that uh, you and I both have a daughter named Juliet with the same spelling. So about that. and and our daughter, Juliet, is named after Romeo and Juliet because most people spell it, you know, with the French spelling. So I knew that we were kind of kindred spirits at that point. <laughs> We had the same theme in mind also. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. And also a little known fact, which you, I'm sure you don't even know about this, but when uh, Sports Illustrated came to do the, um, the famous classroom photo of you yes. and the Lakers in uh, what was that October of 81, I guess. Right. That was my first assignment as an assistant for Sports Illustrated. I was the fourth assistant on that shoot. The photographer was Lane Stewart. And uh, very um, buttoned up, kind of incredibly creative guy. He didn't shoot action. He, he, his whole thing was doing these big productions. And we spent three days building this set in a sound stage and stuff, you know. So I, I don't know if you know this story, Paul, but uh, Lane was a perfectionist, right? And he came in, and I'm sure you remember how everything was perfectly choreographed and who was going to sit where and, you know, how everyone was going to look. And Kareem comes in and he's wearing the red shoes <laughs> and Lane went crazy. I mean, he literally lost his shit. He, he like turned to all of us. He goes, somebody's got to go out and buy shoes for him. And we're like, the guy wears like size 19. We're not going to go to big five and buy shoes for Kareem. <laughs> well, somebody's got to ask him. And lo and behold, nobody asked him. And the, the, that was a good the, decision. <laughs> <laughs> the photo was published. And he's got the red shoes in it. So little known fact about a very iconic moment in uh, sports yeah. photography history. <laughs> well, what I remember about the details is they actually had an apple on the teacher's desk. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I saw an outtake where Kareem is like placing the, you know, like putting the apple in front of you or something. That was a, uh -huh. anyway. <laughs> that was just a, a crazy shoot. Um, but that was the start of my my sort of journey as an assistant and then getting my feet wet, you know, and at the forum, the Lakers and, and Kings right. and all that. Um, <clears throat> so your book, um, The Speed Game, My Fast Times in Basketball, 
Paul, tell me in a nutshell, what what was your motivation to write this book? You know, I, I, I watched the documentary, um, The Guru of Go, you know, and and I didn't know that you were keeping journals throughout your career. So that probably, you know, was helpful. But at this point in time in your life, why did you decide to release this book? Well, uh, I guess my overriding reason was uh, I had a rather unusual basketball system and style of play, Mm -hmm. uh, of which, you know, over 20 jobs that got me fired 14 of the times. (laughs) So I wanted to once and for all put in print what this style was Mm -hmm. and what it did to me, you know, uh, it got me, you know, some some great teams like the Lakers, of which even though uh, the fast break eventually got me fired, mm-hmm. uh, got me the WNBA championship with Diana Taurasi in mm-hmm. Phoenix, and uh, gave me five great years at Loyola Marymount running the the fast break system to perfection. So mm-hmm. I didn't want it to just you know slip away in in the annals of, of basketball, because the style is so unique, Andy, that uh, to just simply say, well, he, he's another fast break coach, you know, I, I'll accept that. But it was a, I was a very unique fast break coach. If I was just another fast break coach, I might be still coaching the Lakers or the Bulls or somebody. But <laughs> because it was so different, I got fired. Right. Um so, you know, I, I know that you're a Shakespearean scholar, you're a teacher, right? And uh, I, I spent some time searching Shakespearean quotes, getting ready for this interview. Is there a, um, a Shakespearean, and I found one, you, let's see if you know it, uh, a Shakespearean quote um, that has anything to do with being stubborn <laughs> and not giving up? <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Uh, you know. Well, well, the only the only character who uh, jumps at me as being stub- stubborn and it didn't work out for him well in the end is Othello. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, he was a leader. He was sure of what he was doing. Yeah. And when he turned on his wife because of false information, mm-hmm. he wouldn't listen to anybody. And, you know, it, it led to disaster. So, yeah. Uh, I wouldn't say I'm quite Othello, but uh, right. I stuck to what I thought was the truth. And sometimes it worked. And sometimes, uh, mm-hmm. as in the, with the Bulls, they said, there's a train leaving tomorrow. Be <laughs> under it. <laughs> so uh, I love it. I, look, I, I, I am all for somebody who sticks with something no matter what. And that's that was what you're, you know, it comes through loud and clear in your book that you just weren't going to give up on it. The quote that I found was from Romeo and Juliet. And it, I don't know if it, if it, if it's even appropriate, but it, um, he says a peevish self-will harlotry. It is. She's a stubborn little brat. <laughs> I don't know the context of that. Yeah. Was that about Juliet? <laughs> <laughs> I don't Couldn't know. Be. I don't know. Uh, it might be. It wasn't my Juliet. I can right. tell you that. <laughs> yeah, well, mine was pretty stubborn as a teenager. Yeah. Got to tell you, but, the, but now she's twenty-five, and I can't say anything to her anymore. Oh, yeah. But anyway, so Paul, take us back to the beginnings of of the speed game. Okay, um, you're a Philly guy, right? Yes. Um, is, is the speed game like? Was it born in Philly or? No. Uh, yeah. What? No. What's What's the genesis of the speed? Well, game? the genesis is, and it surely wasn't born in Philly because uh, Philadelphia basketball, which you know, it was very ritualistic, and you, you had to follow a formula mm-hmm. that was crafted by you know uh, Jack Ramsey and 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 uh, Raleigh Massimino and Chuck Daly. That mm. uh, even though they weren't Philly guys, Ramsey was. Uh, you had to follow a certain formula and you, and you better not deviate uh, because then Mm -hmm. you were singled out as being a a radical. Mm -hmm. Uh, I picked this up outside of Philadelphia in two ways. One during the Mm seventies in the summers, I would coach in San Juan, Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. Uh, They had uh, a Puerto Rican league down there, which was a marvelous league for basketball and, and young coaches like myself, 
uh, would go down and uh, I got more out of the summer learning how to coach and what things to do and not do and learning about players than I ever got in a whole college season. So I was like doubling my advantage. I would coach at LaSalle in the winter, then I'd go to San Juan in the summer. Mm -hmm. So at the end of two or three or four years, my, my experiencing was doubling. Mm. And the Puerto Rican players love to play fast. Mm -hmm. So I had this notion that the, the run fast break, I, I, I picked it up from a, a coach named Sonny Allen from, uh, from Virginia. He said, here's my system. It's really simple, but you have to be a little crazy to do it. Uh -huh. I said, all right, Sonny, I, I can do that. <laughs> so with Sonny Allen and my Puerto Rican players, I became a fast break coach in the city of brotherly love that uh, people for the most part laughed at. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you, but you were convinced, right? You were convinced that if you had the right group of players, right. Yep. And they all bought in on it, that it would actually work. Right. Because yes. you said over and over in the book, you know, you have a quote, executing the system for a full game will always win. Right. Yes. And uh, so basically this, this system, I mean, to the layman who's not really that into, you know, the nuts and bolts of basketball. I mean, it's basically full court, full court press defense and pass break offense. That's how you correct. Describe that it. is it in a nutshell. Right. And, and the offense yeah. is as simple as you could write it on, on your palm. Mm -hmm. uh, every, all five players go to a designated spot as fast as they can. Mm -hmm. shoot the ball as soon as somebody catches it, mm -hmm. you know, from the point guard and go rebound if it's a miss and yeah. do that a hundred times a game and you will win. The problem, uh, Andy, is you can't get players to do that over and over and over enough to break down the opposition. Mm -hmm. Your own team will back off before the opposition backs off. Right. So it, it, once your team backs off, then you're done. Mm. Right. But <clears throat> as, as we'll talk about in a little bit about when you went to LMU, I mean, you, you instituted some really unorthodox training methods to say the least, you know, running the dunes and getting right. the guys, you know, physically um, so prepared that uh, you know, hopefully that the, the opposition would run down before your guys did. And uh, that was a perfect marriage at M M LMU when you had the right players running the system. Right. Um, but you also said that, that you said, it has a great quote that you said, quote, I was coming to believe that coaches were all too quick to fall in love with schemes and strategies while forgetting that players actually play and win games. Increasingly my style dependent on players, not schemes. Right. So it's very player oriented. It, it's Correct. dependent on players, right? Correct. Yeah. So, so what was harder? Was it harder to get players adjusting to the speed game or are you sort of trying to readjust to the players um, along the way? Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I was so committed to the, the, the speed game mm -hmm. that I always felt, even though I, consider myself a player's coach. I think coaches always think they're players coaches. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, I think you really get the truth. You should ask players whether you were a player coach. But anyway, yeah. uh, I made some adjustments in, in my career, uh, particularly in the professional ranks. For example, uh, my second year coaching the Denver Nuggets, uh, we drafted to Kembe Mutumbo. Mm -hmm. And uh, he on the surface would be in my system, uh, someone who would take the ball out of bounds and, and start the fast break with his outlet pass. But he was a little cumbersome and, and, and almost too big to do that. He, he wasn't quick to the ball. Mm -hmm. So I had to make him a runner rather than an outlet man. And I had to add, and I used to have my wings run. And now I had my middle power forward run and he was marvelous hmm. so i because of the player uh, i made an adjustment because otherwise they'd have <laughs> yeah. fired me at the beginning of the season rather than the end of the season <laughs> and Dukembe yeah. Yeah. just gravitated to it he averaged 19 points a game his rookie year hmm. 
I think in his career, he averaged about four points a game. Right, right. Because he, he wasn't an offensive threat. But with his speed, uh, we would throw the ball ahead to him. He'd beat the defense down. I can remember playing Boston Celtics and Robert Parrish at hit, midcourt just stopping and saying, I can't, I'm not going to keep up with this kid. <laughs> and there goes the Kemba just flying by. You know, it's uh, funny because so, I, I don't remember the, the young – Dikembe is as well as you're remembering him. I remember the older Dikembe was a little more, uh, I guess, cumbersome is the word. Oh, no question. Lower. No. You know, uh, well, the young, yeah, there's always was a question about the young Dikembe. How young was he? Yeah, right. <laughs> but but he was, you know, he was mid twenties, yeah. and he could fly. And right. And, and the spin on that is it, it made me adjust. I didn't do it very much, but it made me adjust. Uh, yeah. Yeah. The only other one uh, professionally that I did, I did this with Tracy McGrady when I was with the Orlando Magic. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. McGrady was one of those young guys. He could score at will anywhere over half court. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Tracy, you know, speed wasn't what he wanted to exhibit. He wanted to exhibit his ability to score. So if he could walk down over half court and you threw him the ball and he shot a 45 footer, he'd be happy because then he could just back up and be on defense <laughs> and he could make it from anywhere. So sometimes you run into players that they defy coaching. Like, uh, right. why, why are you asking me to run down here when I can take my time? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So what I did with McGrady and uh, Johnny Davis was the head coach and he allowed me to do this. I said, when you rebound the ball defensively, Tracy, you can be the point guard. Mm -hmm. You can bring the ball down court and dish it out or deal it. And, and, and he liked that. Mm -hmm. So he actually got more defensive rebounds after we inserted that than he ever did because he liked bringing the ball and making decisions and, and passing the guys. He didn't want to do it all the time, but he yeah, liked yeah. it to do enough. Yeah, that's interesting because that wasn't germane to your system. I mean, the system was that, you know, a, a bigger guy would rebound and, and get the ball down court, right, to the point guard. Right, to so, the point guard, always yeah. to the point guard. And we, yeah. we, we work daily on outlet pass to point guard, outlet mm -hmm. pass to point guard. So mm -hmm. uh, in order not to really break my system, I said, well, okay, but if you are the point guard, which <laughs> – then we're not breaking the system. Yeah. And I did it years later when I was in the WNBA with the Phoenix Mercury. Uh, Diana Taurasi was a little bit like McGrady and, and probably more like Michael Jordan. She could do anything. Mm -hmm. uh, and I said to her, if you rebound the ball, you're the point guard. Mm -hmm. And she liked that. Mm, so yeah. uh, it, it fits. So I, my little trick worked a couple of times. <laughs> well, who would you say is the one player throughout your whole career? Because, you know, you're very eloquent in the book about talking about these players. But from your mind, that, that just resisted it from the beginning, but that then embraced it, you know, then, then got it and really flourished under it. Yeah, that, that's a hard one, Andy, because... A, normally when you run into a player who resists, it doesn't get any better. <laughs> they, right. They, they continue to resist that. The, yeah. the one player who probably didn't fit my system. So by his very build and makeup, he, his body resisted would be Kareem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's Kareem the Abdul Jabbar really yeah. wasn't mm -hmm. fit mm -hmm. to be a fast break player. Mm -hmm. over right. and over and over again, like a hundred times a game. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I mentioned in the book one time uh, in, in training camp in Palm Springs, uh, we had a, our opening practice and to finish it off, I tried to be the ultimate college coach and say, all right, now we're going to run lines to show you like uh, we're going to get in shape and who's boss and all that stuff. So we ran lines, which they call it suicide or murder. You run up and down like 10, 20 times yeah. back and forth. Mm -hmm. And we did it. And the players all stumbled to the locker room and Kareem came over, put his arm around me. And he said, Paul, I don't do lines. <laughs> and, he, and he walked away. Yeah. And uh, at that time I was smart enough to realize that I wasn't ever going to run lines again. Yeah. Uh, 
and and he didn't call me coach. He called me Paul. Right. I think the only person he called coach was John Wooden. Mm -hmm. uh, but so Kareem was an interesting take because he wasn't built to be a fast break player. Mm -hmm. He never fought me. He tried to blend in. And subtly, uh, I was smart enough to let him blend in because uh, Kareem was the man. I mm -hmm. mean, you know, we, we can talk about the evolution of Magic Johnson and he became the leader of that team and legitimately so. But in the first year or two or three of Magic's uh, stay with the Lakers, Kareem was the guy. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Everybody knew that. Mm -hmm. I knew that. And if we had a crucial play or time, you know, I was going to live and die with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Mm. You know, that, that story about the running lines kind of reminds me of Bill Sharman used to tell a story about when he instituted the, uh, the shoot around on game day. You know, Bill yep. invented that, I guess. Yes. And that Wilt took him aside after the first one and said, Coach, you either got me in the morning or you got me at night. <laughs> Which one do you want? <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and, and knowing Bill, he, he didn't get him in the morning. <laughs> you, you know, you do remind me uh, of uh, when I coached the, the Denver Nuggets, we, we acquired uh, Walter Davis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, the, the a little background on Walter. He's from North Carolina, coached by Dean Smith. And so he was a precise player. Walter Davis might have been one of the five best shooters I've ever seen, mm. ever. Mm. And he had a spectacular career in Phoenix and uh, they finally let him go because he was mid thirties, 35, 36, 37. Mm -hmm. So he comes to us and the first day of practice, he comes to me, he says, coach, uh, I need to talk to you. I said, what's that Walter? He says, well, so my knees are so bad that you either get me to practice or play the games. Uh, and he says, I'm willing to do which one you want. I said, Walter, you're going to be standing around with me at practice. <laughs> so it's the same decision. And, and you could tell he, he was a veteran guy. He, he wasn't making stuff up. He, he knew what he could do and he surely knew what he couldn't do. Yeah, for sure. You know, it makes me think about, um, I had a conversation with Phil Jackson once about, um, I, I had started to have kids and, and, you know, Phil had kids and we would go to dinner on the road or whatever. And talk about everything except basketball, I guess. And one of the conversations was about parenting. And I just asked him, I said, Phil, um, you know, what's the difference between coaching these guys and, and parenting he goes, Andy, it's the same goddamn thing. It's just, they have more money. <laughs> so it's like you, you started off as a teacher, you know, right. and teaching and coaching, where is the common ground there? I mean, you have to be incredibly patient, I guess, but yeah, now you're dealing with professional, like grown men and, and women, yeah. of course. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, there's a great parallel between teaching and coaching. Uh, and the one factor that jumps at me is in both cases, you need to be very prepared. Uh, you know, you, you just as a college or a high school teacher, you just don't walk in and wing it. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, well, you know, I was up late last night, so uh, let's talk about Macbeth. I mean, you you better know what your game plan is. And it's certainly true in, in coaching. You know, you just can't show up and say, OK, guys, let's run up and down a little bit here. I mean, you have to have a plan. You have to break it down. You have to be precise. And obviously, you know, uh, that the difference is, though, unlike a teacher, there's going to be a game day. You know, mm -hmm. you're going to have to deliver that plan during the game. And in game time, there's always variables that you didn't practice for. Yeah, I did. That's why ultimately, yeah. you know, and, and, and I would say this to all levels of sports. When you get to crunch time, go to your best player. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, and, and you pick a sport and, and you know, uh, I want Mike Trout to be a bet if I have to, if I have to have one guy that's going to make or break the game. Yeah. I want Gretzky behind the net. Yep, you know, exactly. Figure it out who to pass it to yeah. for you. <laughs> exactly. Sure. So Paul, let's talk about your time at the Lakers. Like I said, this is a time when I you know, started getting involved with the, you know, with the NBA and the Lakers and 
kind of figuring things out. So the history is you, you came to the Lakers with your good friend, Jack McKinney, you were his assistant, right? 79 yes. season. You had known and worked with Jack at St. Joe's. Um, 13 games into the season, Jack has this terrible bicycle accident, terrible uh, brain injury. And you are elevated to an interim coach, head coach, right? And yes. And your thought, I guess I got from the book, was that you thought Jack was going to come back at some point, right? That yes. It was kind of expected that he was going to recover and come back. And the decision was made that he wasn't coming back, even though he, he did recover, right? So all of a sudden you're the head coach and that had to be really difficult. Cause I mean, you describe it very well in the book, how he's your friend and you feel like, you know, you're kind of torn. You want to be head coach obviously, but you don't want it to be under those circumstances. Right. Um, looking back on all that, I mean, you know, how was, how do you feel that was handled? Um, not by you, but overall, I mean, could it have been done differently? I don't know. I'm not sure how I feel about it. Cause I was on the outside, but being on the inside, I wonder yeah. how you feel. Yeah. I, I, sometimes time and distance gives you a, a, a fresher perspective, but uh, even 40 years later, it, it was still a very difficult thing. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, Jack had the serious injury. He's the one who brought me to Los Angeles He's the one that helped me innumerable times before that. He, uh, I mentioned my Puerto Rican coaching. He got me my job in Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. He hired me as his freshman coach at St. Joseph's for, out of a, being a high school coach. So McKinney, you know, you know, did things for me, you know, that I, I can never repay. Mm -hmm. uh, however, the extent of his injury was such that, you know, he was in a hospital for weeks and then he came out and, and he was still recovering, you know, he had some broken bones and things. They mended, but he wasn't quite as sharp as before the injury. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, the Lakers, uh, through their doctors and through their conversations, you know, made that decision that uh, Jack wasn't really ready to return. Mm. Now, on the other hand, and in a practical sense, I think they felt the team was doing pretty well. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm not giving them a total pass. Like, had we be losing, they either would have gotten another coach or maybe said, well, maybe McKinney is ready. <laughs> you, know, let, you know, let's figure this out. But yeah. because the team was doing well, because they had – realistic doubts about his presence and his ability to coach at that time. Uh, they just kept pat hand and said, well, we're just going to hold back. Were you running the speed game with Jack? No, no. no. So I was running the McKinney system and, <laughs> and that, that's the yeah. irony of all this. Yeah. You know, Jack McKinney put in a system before he was injured that he received from Jack Ramsey and the Portland trailblazers who won a championship with him. McKinney was an assistant then. Mm -hmm. So I was for the most part, just in a compliant, you know, substitute teacher, mm. you know, uh, we got the game plan. Let, let, let's right. just go. And sure enough, you know, I had to make some adjustments, you know, the, the whole Spencer Haywood issue came up. Yeah. I had to make some adjustments, but for the most part, I followed Jack's system and, you know, we won a championship. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So I, you had to put your system to the side then. Yes. You, I never won? brought it in at that time. Later yeah. I did. Later. Yeah. When, yeah. when the following year, right. Yeah. You guys lost to Houston, but then the following year after that. Um, so you, <laughs> you're in LA, you're dealing with a lot of personalities in the front office, you know, Dr. Buss, Jerry West, Bill Sharman. And of course you got, Guys on the court, you're dealing with Kareem, Norm Nixon, Magic. You, you mentioned Spencer Haywood. Um, true story that he he actually had you, you know, was contracting somebody to kill you. Is that actually true? I mean, that yeah. is, just blew my mind that when I read yeah. that. Well, I didn't know it at the time. I yeah. it blew my mind, too. <laughs> Holy but crap. That, he actually it, came to me afterwards when I was coaching at LMU, came to my office and sat down and, you know, he he was in that process that you had to go back and tell the people that you 
hurt or uh, potentially hurt uh, to uh, move on with your life. And so I was on his list. Wow. And I said, well, Woody, I'm glad to see you, man, because otherwise I'd be dead. <laughs> Holy crap. I mean, that, that's incredible. Is this the first time that that's been revealed was in your book that that he threatened to kill you or have you killed? Yeah, well, I don't know if it was the first. Andy, uh, uh, about two or three years before he came to me, mm -hmm. uh, Scott Osler wrote a book of, uh, on Spencer Haywood. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of the stuff uh, concerning it. Spencer was in that book. I don't know how detailed, but yeah, I got to talk to my buddy, Mark Spears. You probably know, uh, he just wrote a book about Spencer Haywood. So, which I haven't yes, read I, yet. He I gave me that of, yeah. I got to read that. Um, so Paul, you know, you talk about in your book that you had a, a great relationship with magic throughout. Right. And that yes. even post firing, you still considered you had, you had a good relationship with magic. I mean, do you feel that you're firing at that time, right? This is the early eighties, right? That that was like the beginning of what we see now all the time with athlete empowerment, you know, kind of athletes calling their own shots. I mean, how do you feel about it? Yeah. Well, I, I didn't think of it at the time, but looking back, uh, yes. Uh, uh, you know, the whole background of magic and I, was very positive. Mm -hmm. uh, I, 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 you know, there's some players you always have little rubs with, and, and it's just inevitable that, you know, it's going to reach a point that, you know, something bad is going to happen. Mm -hmm. That was not the case with Magic. Mm -hmm. The background of Magic is, as you remember, he had knee surgery the year before. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, seeing him in training camp the following year and seeing him early in our season, he wasn't ready. Uh, he had lost the step mm -hmm. and he was struggling and a high level athlete who's struggling isn't a happy person. Mm -hmm. So magic was at, in sorts, he was angry. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately for me, part of his anger was this new system, this coach who's making us do things and, you know, uh, so uh, I was the object of his frustration, mm -hmm. whether I deserved it or not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the tipping point was we played a game in Salt Lake City and near the end of the game it was a tight game. I had a timeout. I was giving instructions on what we had to do in this last possession to win. And Magic was looking away like I could care less what you're saying, coach. Uh, so we go out and darn if the very thing that I talked about happened and to our advantage, the Utah jazz missed an open shot. And, and I said, I cannot let this continue. So after the game, talked to the team, brought magic into an other locker room. I didn't want to embarrass him in front of the players. And I said, this cannot continue. You cannot do this. When, when a game is online, you need to be focused with me. Mm -hmm. And he just walked away. Uh, you know, like, is that all he had to say? Yeah, yeah, goodbye. And then apparently he talked to the press and said, I don't want to play here anymore. Mm -hmm. So he put it upon Jerry Buss to make a decision. Now, in my mind, uh, a teacher that I am, I'm saying, well, we're going to have to show this young player, you know, uh, this is the way things go. You know, you just don't pout and walk away and say, I'm going to take my ball and go home. Mm -hmm. So when a meeting was called to, to be with Jerry Buss, uh, before I went to the meeting, my, my uh, college daughter, Monica, had lunch with me and I told her the whole story. She said, Dad, you're going to get fired. <laughs> I said, Oh no, I'm not. No, I'm not. Don't worry about it, honey. Go back to your chemistry class. I'll mm. be fine. And sure enough, uh, bus fired me. Mm. And I'm, I, I say all this because <clears throat> the incident caused me to get fired. It, it you know, it happened within 16 hours. Mm -hmm. So it, it wasn't like a coincidence, but I have to say upon reflection, I really think that for whatever reason, the Laker organization uh, had had enough of me. And they used the magic incident to end it. Mm -hmm. So he was the poster boy 
for what they wanted. Mm-hmm. So uh, I, I would not hold Magic Johnson responsible for uh, what finally happened. Yeah, I'm curious. Over the years, have you guys chatted, talked about it? I don't. Know. No, we've not talked about it. But he, you know, we met each other. We've we've talked, and and as least recently as nine months ago, he called me at home and said. We're going to have an event in Hawaii uh, to celebrate our our 80s teams. Mm-hmm. We'd love you to come. I said, hey, Magic, I, I would love to come. So mm-hmm. that was all set up. They, they had tickets and everything for uh, the flights. And then because of COVID, everything's been canceled. Well, hopefully that'll happen. We all, yeah, I would like we all, that. We all need that. <laughs> yep. we all yeah. Need so, Paul, you leave the Lakers. You, uh, you bounce around a little bit. Go to Denver. You go to... George Mason, then you end up at LMU, right? And yeah. you say that um, you you quoted here. You said the, um, the speed game was most successful at LMU. That the system became the star, right? And that when Bo Kimball and Hank Gathers decided to leave USC and come to LMU, you said that that changed LMU and your coaching career forever, right? So here are two Philly guys coached by a Philly guy. (laughs) It seemed like the perfect marriage. I mean, this, this documentary guru of go, which I hadn't seen before. It was, it was so great. I mean, it's just, it looked like these guys just flourished on flying up and down the court. You know, Hank gathers led the country in rebounding and in scoring. I mean, I think the second player in history to ever do that. Right. Correct. Unbelievable. And how, how, how were you feeling at that point? You, were you feeling like there was a redemption or <laughs> that, you know, I told you so, or what? I mean, what were you feeling? Yeah. Well, I, I, I felt finally, uh, I found a group of young men who said they wanted the fast break. I put them to the task and they, after days of practice, turned and said, what else you have? Mm. Like, you know, we're in. Like, wow. mm. give us more. And I have to back up and say, most of the teams I coach, they say they want a fast break. And after about six or seven days, there is a team meeting, <laughs> players only. And they say, we, we got to do something about this guy because this guy's nuts. He's crazy. This, this guy's nuts. This, this is too hard. We don't want to do this. Yeah. So what, what was I thinking when the LMU players looked at me saying, uh, how about some more of these drills and, and fast things? Yeah. How about some more sand dunes in Manhattan Beach? Uh, I said, thank you very much, folks. We're going to have a lot of fun here. Yeah, not only sand dunes, you're doing stuff in the pool. you having them run 100-yard yeah. dashes with parachutes. I mean, who was Correct. doing that? Nobody was doing that in those days. I mean, I go back to the Lakers where nobody was doing video in those days before you and Pat Riley started looking at video. You know, you Correct. might have recorded the wrong channel, which was an hilarious story. <laughs> but, but people have to read the book to to, see, to read that. But um, but you were such an innovator is what I'm trying to yeah, say. Yeah, yeah. You you know, you, you speak of uh, Pat Riley, though, when when he became my assistant coach, and it was uh, not in my mind, but in the Lakers' mind, it was a little bit out of default. They, they really didn't want Pat to be my assistant. They wanted him to stay as color man with Chick Hearn. Mm-hmm. And I kept coming back and say, no, I think Riley's the right one. And I say, no, Riley's the right one. So they, so Jerry Buss finally said, okay, you, you can have Pat Riley. Mm. Uh, I, I tell you that because one of the things that Riley immediately picked up and became very good at was the whole video world. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I guess because he had a background doing the TV work with Chick, he, he knew how things broke down. And back then, I don't think there's anybody in the NBA knew how to break down a film, hmm. let alone, I mean, we could look at them maybe, yeah, yeah, <laughs> but, yeah. but the stop, start to edit to, so, so Riley began to uh, edit individual films for players. Riley began to edit the first half of a game and we could show it to our players at halftime. Wow. That so, he was doing. So that. I would, you know, there'd be yeah. a player I'm, I'm, I'm picking on Jim Jones a little bit. And we say, you know, Jim, you got to do a better job rebounding. You, you, you didn't, you didn't block out four or five times. And he said, no, 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 coach. I, I was blocking out. 
And and we said, well, okay, let's take a look at the video. Yeah. Now. <laughs> but but you're talking like the infancy of video. I mean, you exactly. know, with these gigantic Betamax tapes and and having editing equipment. I mean, exactly. Do you remember, do you remember Bill Desser, who was like the first video editor for the Lakers? It might I do. You left. Well, then you remember. No, I know. Yeah, I remember being on the road with Bill, and and there was no editing room or any place he could go. He'd have to be like in a little closet somewhere underneath the seats. Yeah. You know, his little, his well, little Riley was there. actually wired on the bench uh-huh. and he would say to whoever Bill or whoever was in, in this little <laughs> dark room, say, <laughs> uh, mark that, mark that. And, and I'll give you something. It's wow. not in the book, which is, is kind of interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, we were in a game against Phoenix and it's a crucial play uh, two or three minutes ago. It's Phoenix ball. The, and uh, we have to make a stop in order to win this game. Mm-hmm. And I'm in the huddle saying, Hey, well, you do this. And if they, if they run a pick and roll, we're going to do X, Y, Z. And I'm chatting along. And I'm guessing that what play uh, John McLeod's going to run. And we're about to break and Riley taps me on the shoulder. And, and he says, do you really want to know what they're going to run? <laughs> And I said, what? He said, yeah, we had a camera on his, on his bench. He says, I know exactly what they're going to run. Oh, my God. That's hilarious. And I, and I said, no, nah, Pat, let it go. What the hell? You know, and so I, I disregarded him. Uh, and but I'm just showing you how he was way ahead. Uh, yeah. Time at the, and then ultimately the league figured that out. I think Bill Fitch ran into a problem in, in Boston with it. Right. And the, the league said no electronic equipment uh, is permitted on the bench. That's hilarious. You know, you, you describe yourself as a crazy genius. Pat was pretty crazy himself. You yeah, know? that was his world, though. Yeah. yeah. He, he, yeah. He, 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 he was very good at that. Right. And, and it, it's become the norm, you know, throughout the league, of course. I mean, everybody's doing that now. Yep. Um, so I, I just want to go back to LMU, Paul, and, you know, the tragic death of Hank Gathers. I, I wasn't at that game, but of course I was living in L.A. then. And I remember when it happened and I had never really seen the footage until I saw it in the documentary. But um, I mean, it, there's no words to describe it. Um, and, but as the coach, as the leader of the team, I mean, what, what, I mean, even looking back now, it's, it's so incredibly sad and tragic. And the re- relationship you had with him, you said that uh, he and Kareem were pretty much the two players you, were the, you felt equals to, equal right. to, you know, throughout your career. The decision to, to, that you put to the players, whether they wanted to continue the season or not, were you surprised that they didn't even take a second to decide that they were going to play the rest of the year for Hank? Yeah, to be honest, uh, Andy, I was surprised because mm-hmm. uh, we were all uh, devastated by Hank's death. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, to a point that we were we were speechless. We were like zombies just walking around. Uh, the only time we were social was when there would be an event. Mm-hmm. Uh, the LMU had a, had a big event. Uh, uh, morning and a mass morning, the death of Hank gathers. And then uh, the whole team went back to North Philadelphia and went to uh, his family's church and the burial. So, I mean, that, that was the only thing that we were doing. So subsequent to that, when the players said, you know, we want to keep going. Yeah. I was surprised. I mean, uh, uh, and, and I didn't realize it at the time, but, then I re- realized why they were so hurt and they were so sorrowful that basketball was their only outlet. It was the only thing they could do to, for an hour or two a day, forget. Yeah. Yeah. And it really sp- spiraled into games. You know, we're now in the NCAA tournament and, mm. you know, you know, everyone talks about, well, you got to win the first and win them all and all that because everybody is jittery and apprehensive in game one of an NCAA tournament. Even if you're a good team, you're jittery because you don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. Our players were not jittery. They, they were very composed. They were, 
they they were just doing it for Hank, mm-hmm. doing mm-hmm. it for themselves, but not worrying about winning and losing. See, that's what makes you jittery. You yeah. know, like, hey, if we, we can't lose this game or we have to win this game, they mm-hmm. didn't think about that. They mm-hmm. were above that or below that any way you want to look at it. Mm-hmm. So they played very free and easy. And, you know, and that, therefore, that's why it was so marvelous the way they performed. Yeah. I mean, you guys got to the Elite Eight, right? Correct. Yeah, that was what a run that was. Amazing. So you leave LMU, you go. Um, to Japan, which which you said was one of the two teams that really embraced your system. Guys don't speak English, but they know how to run, right? So <laughs> that's a good thing. But you end up yeah, in well, Phoenix. Well, you end up in it, Phoenix. It is interesting. When, yeah. when I was, in, <laughs> pardon me. Good. Yeah. Well, when I was in Japan, uh-huh. uh, you know, you, you could bring two players. You know, what they called foreigners, and you know, I I brought two very good uh, American players. You know. Uh, Mark Sanford from UW and David Booth, uh, who was a, was a good, you know, NBA player. They were both very competent guys. Mm-hmm. And, and I really related to them because they're the only ones I could talk to. Mm-hmm. So we, we'd have a team meeting and there was like 10 Japanese fellas and these two. So I would run things by Sanford and Booth. So, but I found out I ran the system and, Mark Sanford and David Booth played like Americans. You know, they played like Tracy McGrady. <laughs> uh, they, they just wanted to go at a goodly speed. They wanted to win the game. They, you know, but they didn't want to sprint nonstop every yeah. play. Mm-hmm. So uh, as I mentioned in the book, one time they were sent home for a month because there were going to be an all Japan tournament that they weren't permitted to play. Mm. Yeah. And we were a, a decent team in the league, but without them, we got to the finals of this tournament because <laughs> my Japanese players ran nonstop the system. Yeah. <laughs> so oh, that's funny. There's, there's a perfect example that if you can't get the players to do it, the system doesn't work. Yeah. If yeah. You can, <clears throat> you might be able to win everything. Yeah. Were any of those players even remotely good enough to play in the NBA? Do you think? Oh, no, no, no. no. And, and, and they didn't really, they didn't aspire to that. Uh, they, you know, they, they work for the corporation. The team I coach in Osaka was Panasonic mm-hmm. or in Japanese, it was Machishito electric. Okay. And they were employees there. So they, they worked during the day, then they would come to practice and then we would travel on the weekends and play games. Mm-hmm. In fact, one little interesting uh, sidebar on that is uh, we would play weekends, like traveling all over uh, Japan, like uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So it'd be Sunday night. We'd be on the bullet train coming home. Mm-hmm. And I say to my Japanese assistant, uh, Tenichi, I think we should give the players a day off tomorrow. You know, so a long weekend and and he'd say, no, 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 coach. No, no day off. I said, what are you talking about? He says, no, they don't want a day off because if you give them a day off from practice, they have to go to work and work all day. (laughs) They better be running up and down the court. No, they otherwise they get a half day. They they work at noon and then they come and hang out for the rest of the day. That's hilarious. Oh, but what an experience that must have been. Yeah, it was a great experience. Did your family go with you when you? My wife did. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it almost broke up our marriage (laughs) because (laughs) she. She said to me, I was there weeks and she said she was crying. I said, hey, honey, I know you miss the kids and everything. She said, no, it's not the kids. It's you. (laughs) For the first time in our married life, I have you 24 (laughs) seven. Right. Right. It's like the pandemic. And my wife and I, she's a lawyer. She's working from home, you know, and uh, there's this joke out there that I married you for better or for worse, but not for lunch. You know, (laughs) (laughs) But, and the other twist with my wife was she's yeah. in Osaka, Japan, and no one speaks English. Oh, God. So yeah, It's me imagine. or nobody. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> well, Paul, just to close out the whole picture here, you end up in Phoenix, right? 27 yes. years after you win the championship with the yes. Lakers, you win one with the Mercury. And uh, with one of the greatest players in WNBA history, truly a legend, Diana Taurasi. Um, but you're... 
I think this is true that you're still the only coach to win a championship in both leagues, unless somebody else has done it that I'm not aware of, but that's yeah. quite an accomplishment in 27 years in between uh, and a lot of miles traveled. Yeah. Yeah. Andy, you know, when I won it with the Lakers and we were flying high, I thought this is going to be fun. This is going to be easy. Mm-hmm. How, how many more are we going to win? Well, Little did I know I wasn't going to win anymore with the Lakers. Yeah, yeah. And it would take me 27 years to win another championship. But, uh, mm-hmm. but it it just speaks of you need to hang in. You need to have a good system. But you really need players. I mean, mm-hmm. you can't win without Magic and Kareem and Jamal Wilkes. I mean, uh, you can't win without Diana Taurasi and Penny Taylor and Cappy Pondexter. I mean, no matter how good you think you are, you can't <laughs> win without right. quality players. And and, and yeah. I just jump ahead and uh, watching everything uh, mm-hmm. from home in the, in the bubble. You can't win without LeBron James and Anthony Davis. Very true. It's yeah. the combo that gives you the chance to win. Yeah. And, uh, I hope that team and I hope Frank Vogel realizes that uh, enjoy what you have because you never know how many more you're going to get. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Paul, I want to close on a quote because you brought up, you know, the team and the players and what makes up, you know, what, what adds up to success. I want to close with this quote that you have in Bruce from Bruce Springsteen from his book, born to run his autobiography, where he talks about putting a rock band together and describes it as a trick involving chemistry, luck and quicksilver, something that can produce a moment that lasts forever. When the world is at its best, he writes, when we are at our best, when life feels fullest one and one equals three. So is that how you felt? When, when the system was working, you know, at LMU, uh, Japan, um, the Lakers were running it, you know, the Mercury, I mean, did one and one equal three for you? It was like, is that the feeling? Absolutely, Andy. But I, I, to, to play off uh, Springsteen, you know, he has done, I mean, he's a marvelous performer and he's done thousands of gigs. Mm-hmm. But as he indicates, it only happens once in a while mm-hmm. he doesn't step on a stage and it happens over and over and over and over again so the few times that it happened and if i had the single any one out uh, clearly it happened at lmu mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. uh one plus one with that group of young men equal three <laughs> yeah amazing well Paul, you couldn't have said it more eloquently than the boss. And uh, <laughs> I'm glad we could close with that because, um, you know, this book was really fascinating for me to read. And I've been around the game so much, but I didn't really know about the speed game, honestly. Um, it happened a little bit before my time, but I'm so happy to read it from your point of view. And, uh, and again, you know, whether it was being stubborn or just believing in what you believed in, um, you know, my hat's off to you, man, for staying with it. Thanks, Andy. I'm and to your wife, too, for staying with you, because, you yeah, know, yeah, we're still together. <laughs> I you know, it had to come to some point where she said it's the speed game or me, buddy. You know, it's like one yeah. or the other. Well, you, you do know how I finish up by saying is she my last interview. She said, just tell them you're normal. Tell them you're <laughs> Jim Beheim or tell right. them, <laughs> just say you're a regular coach. And, and right. I had, I had to say, I'm going to knock your socks off. That's right. Because you're the crazy genius. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Paul, best of luck, man. So great to connect with you. And thanks Andy. for your time today. I really appreciate it. And uh, stay well. I hope I see you post pandemic somewhere down the road. Yeah, it'd be my pleasure. It'd be great to go to that 80s reunion together. I got to talk yeah, to you about that because somebody's got to photograph it. So it might as well there you go. There. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to see you in Hawaii. <laughs> that would be awesome, man. Thanks so much. And stay safe thanks, Andy. and get that vaccine soon so we can all get back to normal. <laughs> Thank all right, you. Take care, Paul. Bye. Well, I really enjoyed chatting with Paul Westhead today. I hope you guys enjoyed it too. Thanks to Paul for taking the time and for writing his book, The Speed Game, My Fast Times in Basketball. The book is available now and folks, I really highly recommend it. Thanks also, as always, to my producer and researcher, Veronica Ahn. And thanks to my friend and first boss, by the way, Steve Brenner, for helping schedule today's interview with Paul. 
Thanks, everyone out there for continuing to download and subscribe to our podcast. A reminder that you can find us on the LA Times app and online, as well as your favorite podcast platforms, including Apple and Spotify. Please follow us on our social media, our Instagram at Legends of Sport, our Twitter at Legends underscore of Sport. Our blog is legendsofsport.blog and our TikTok and YouTube channels, Legends of Sport. You can find my photography on Instagram at ADB Photo Inc. So thanks, everyone. We'll be back in two weeks with another great guest and episode. Please check our social media for an announcement. And until then, stay safe, stay well, and wear your mask. <laughs> See you.